Hello, my name is Ruben Mesa and I'm the president of Atrium Health Levine Cancer and the executive director of the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Comprehensive Cancer Center. And joined here today by my wonderful decades log friends and global MPN experts, Professor Claire Harrison from Guys in St. Thomas. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. And of course, P Professor Jean-Jacques Kilajan from Hôpital Saint-Louis in Paris. Jean-Jacques, welcome. Hi, Ruben. Well, we're coming to you live from uh, ASH 2023 here in San Diego. And this is really is the uh, aggregate meeting for uh, uh, true uh, MPN updates, really, uh, on an international basis. This and the European Hematology Association meeting really being key ones. So let's jump right into it. Claire, let's first start kind of more uh, with ET. Anything that struck you, something interesting that folks that are watching this that may be impacting their practice or changing the landscape for ET in the near future? Well, I think there's a couple of things. What One is a young person's analysis, but I'm going to leave Jean-Jacques to talk about that because that's really his brainchild. And uh, I suppose the most important thing for ET is uh, that we're on the verge of doing some very large phase three studies with BOMA-DEMSTAT, uh, the LSD1 inhibitor, which has been tested quite extensively in myelofibrosis and in a phase one, two study with ET. And what's been presented here is an update on that study showing durability of responses, but also an emerging key theme in our field is about molecular responses. So we'll be seeing an oral presentation on that, and then we'll be rolling into some large phase three upfront and second line studies. So I think that's the main positive um, aspect for ET at this, at this meeting. You know, I think it's going to be uh, you know, key as we see more options evolving for ET. Uh, Bamadamstad, I had the uh, pleasure of having an investigator initiate a study for that in ET when I was in San Antonio and clearly active, so it would be great to see that go through the phase three process to kind of quantify that benefit. Uh, we have the ropegulated interferon studies in ET that continue to uh, mature, uh, one fully uh, accrued with the surpass ET study. So excited to see those data, as well as we, you know, hopefully expand our, our armamentarium a little it's further. Certainly, a long time since we had a new a new drug for ET patients, right? So yeah. ruxolitinib not looking so positive in the Magic yeah. ET data, probably because it's causing anemia, as yeah. we expect. Good for symptoms, but not approved in that setting. So it'd be really exciting if we can get to um, delivering a new agent for those patients. No, without question. And John Jack, you know, more continues to evolve in PV. Obviously, you've helped to lead this field for, for, for so long. What, what struck you of this, Ash, about uh, PV? Well, we have, as, as Claire mentioned, we could collect a large number of young patients, uh, younger than 25 years of age when they were diagnosed with ET or PV, and most of them were PV. Uh, and we could study, based on that large number of patients, the impact of drugs on their outcome, and found, and that will be presented uh, today here, at ASH that treatment with interferon alpha could uh, have an impact, a very positive impact on progression-free survival with less transformation, less evolution to fibrosis. So really important information for this particular population of young patients. We also have new data showing that molecular response can be achieved with ruxolitinib also. This was found in the MAGIC PV study that was presented last year, but here we see again with ruxolitinib an impact of this drug for reducing the mutant allele burden and hopefully uh, helping to modify the disease history. Wonderful. Well, it's got to be so gratifying for for you, you're building on the work of Dick Silver and Harriet Gilbert and all the work that you had done. You know, as we continue to learn more about the impact of interferon, you know, it's so important to really have an individual patient view as you manage these patients. And again, younger patients, I think just, just really bringing more data to what we've always expected, you know, more impact on the disease, good control. You know, we clearly have learned uh, appropriate dosing and managing the patients is really key for that. I think as we've learned actually, Jean-Jacques, from that um, cohort, the risk of progression is not small for these young yeah. patients in, in the cohort that we pulled together across the EHA group as 20% of patients yeah. at 20 years. And so you know, really doing these kind of retrospective data analysis is a really important way of understanding that and understanding the impacts of the decisions we've made today. And it runs in line with 
you know, Professor Barbui's data about uh, low risk PV not really being so low risk and needing to think about intervening. I wonder if you agree. Yes, absolutely. Although we don't have really new drugs this year in the field of PV coming out, we learn more about how to treat these patients and maybe change our way of treating them from the beginning, and especially young patients, as you mentioned, because probably phlebotomy only is not the solution. Uh, it's a result, it, it reduces the risk of vascular events, thrombotic events on the short term, but the disease is still there. And we saw with this cohort of young patients that after 20 years, the risk of evolution is really high. And we need probably to assess now new strategies uh, with these new drugs to see how we can introduce them maybe earlier uh, in the disease uh, evolution to prevent such transformation. You know, and from my end, I'm hopeful that we'll continue to learn more about the biology of why patients transform so we can better kind of monitor that therapy in between. I, I know it's been a frustration for myself is I'm never really quite sure if I'm at the right dose. Mm -hmm. You know, I can control the counts, but is that dose sufficient for controlling counts really equivalent to avoiding progression? I don't think we know, but but I, I think it'll be great as we learn more about that biology. Is that molecular markers? Is that you know some cytokine profile? Is that something else that uh, that tells us that? I think it's the molecular marker. But yeah. my personal bet would be yeah. on that it's the 50% or 25% reduction or even mm -hmm. better, the phenomenal responses you've seen yeah. in some patients. Yes, and I think the more we study these patients in depth, I mean, for example, by next generation sequencing, we collect more and more information sure. and we see that in fact, these patients have sometimes additional mutations to the driver mutation that completely can change the outcome of the disease and detecting them early may probably lead in the future to more personalized or precision medicine. I don't know how we can call that, but this is really a field, I think, MPNs and PV and MF in particular, where these molecular markers will help us in the future to better tailor the treatment to an individual patient. You know, I, I know I've been evolving in my practice to try to get the, the NGS myeloid panels, you know, more really across the board, particularly at baseline. You know, I think that that data will become more and more important over time, you know, to, to give us really a window into that. Well, let's pivot finally to myelofibrosis. So, you know, in, in many ways, the energy around new drug development is frequently begins with myelofibrosis, greatest unmet need, greatest threat to mortality. We have here in the U.S. approved now four JAK inhibitors, ruxolitinib, fedratinib, pacridinib, and most recently in September, mamelodinib, with an indication for myelofibrosis with anemia. Uh, and again, anticipate that those will be uh, evolving in terms of availability you know, in different parts of the world in kind of different, different time frames. But clearly the energy in this meeting was really around the first phase three combination studies that were reported out in the frontline setting for myelofibrosis and what those uh, mean. Uh, Claire, what, what was your takeaway? We had phase three of both ruxolitinib plus palabresib versus ruxolone and then ruxolitinib plus navidoclax versus ruxolone. Well, it's probably quite a, it's a big tease, isn't it? Yeah. And, but it's also probably quite in, a little bit confusing for our listeners because uh, much as we were just discussing learning more about biology, the problem in myelofibrosis is we haven't evolved our endpoints. So um, competing sessions, strong data, large studies. Let's talk first about palabresib, maybe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a really big study, 430 patients randomized. It just by one is the second biggest study we've ever... After uh, Simplify One. After yeah. Simplify mm -hmm. One. But, you know, we know that JAK inhibitors have changed the way we think about the disease. We're like just over a decade, maybe 12, 13 years now, but we know that there are limitations. So striving to do more is important, thinking about the impacts of these therapies on the hallmarks of disease. But then having these studies, talking first about palabresib, strong signal on spleen, good signal on toxicity, actually more grade three events strikingly in the ruxolitinib mm -hmm. monotherapy arm, um, but missing on the symptom aspect. And, and I think it makes us reflect that, actually, should we really be aiming to drive down the symptom burden further, or is it enough to say, we add another drug, it has side effects, but the patient's symptom benefit is the same. 
and I guess yeah. you're the guru on that, Ruben. So let's hear what your thoughts are. Well, I think the the you know near doubling of spleen volume response rate with 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 both trials, I think, very very meaningful. You know, in the Pelabressive study, we did analysis to show when one looks at it by absolute change in total symptom score, you know, it, it was nearing statistical significance for the combination. You know, and for mine, I think that's very relevant. You know, one, as we look at the granularity of the data, I think there is a bit of a ceiling effect in terms of how much symptoms can improve. Because again, this was frontline, patients had a significant improvement in symptoms. You start to get down to that range where, again, you're, you're, you're you know, bumping up against kind of the maximum amount that you can kind of improve the symptoms. So there really may not have been enough really kind of space in terms of the residual symptoms to really prove superiority. You know, so I view it as, as very positive. You know, I look at the symptoms also to confirm that patients are not really feeling worse. By, exactly. by being on combination, which clearly they were not. Now, Jean-Jacques, uh, Claire and I, they had them in two different rooms. Claire and I were in the room for the <laughs> Pelabressive study, although we were, we were listening to the Nivitaclax study on the virtual platform, so very high tech. We got the phone open, have the uh, AirPod in for one abstract, listening to the other. But you were in the room for the discussion around the Nivitaclax study. What, were, what was your takeaways? Yeah, it was very close, as you mentioned. The Two studies provided almost similar results in terms of spleen volume reduction, doubling compared to ruxolitinib alone, missing for the uh, improvement, further improvement in the symptom response. But as you said, is it really the aim? Uh, the, the first aim is not to harm the patient and to keep the response there. That is already wonderful on rugs. We must say that the vast majority of patients is doing well on rugs and it's nice to see that adding another drug doesn't impair that response. Then what is the aim of adding another drug on first-line therapy? Probably not just for the symptoms, but you want probably to alter, again, deeply the, the disease history, the risk of transformation to acute leukemia, etc. So I think to fully appreciate the impact of these two combinations, we need to wait for more information, more biological information in terms of biomarkers. Is the fibrosis uh, 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 better on mm -hmm. these drugs? Is uh, the mutant allele burden lower with these drugs? Uh, does the cytokine profile uh, move in the right way? I think this will bring us more information to see if really adding something to RUX has a meaningful impact on the outcome of patients on the long term as first-line therapy. You know, I think time is going to be very important. I, I'm mindful we were reminiscing that we were here in San Diego 12 years ago exactly when kind of the matured uh, comfort data was being presented. It had been approved in the U.S. just in November of, of 2011, you know, and that, you know, I think some of these benefits will take time. You know, I think part of the challenge of large phase three studies is you want to read out those results as early as you can, but, but you know, time really is important for progression-free survival and these other benefits. So before we conclude, you know, uh, what are things you guys are excited about as we're moving forward? I know from my end, you know, there remains a lot of uh, a buzz around both monoclonal antibodies and vaccine therapies around calreticulin. You know, those will be moving into clinical trials. I think a couple patients have already been dose, but obviously very, very early at this point. Uh, Claire, things that, that you're really looking forward to in this next year or two for us to learn on? Well, I, I think many of the things we've already discussed clearly super excited about calreticulin, but we need to understand a yeah. lot more about that. How's it going to work? Toxicity, etc. And we've got at least three different modalities there, bispecific, vaccination, antibody, and maybe more than one antibody. I think um, seeing the maturity of these phase three trials is going to be really important for me. And we have the little teaser for Pelabressive on fibrosis responses, cytokine responses, and anemia responses. We didn't see that for Navitaclax. So I'm looking forward to um, more data evolving from that um, perspective. And I'm looking forward to a study that Jean-Jacques and I are working on together in PV. So the frontline PV study, Mithridate, yeah, soon to open yes. in France, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And Jean-Jacques, how about yourself? Something you're excited about for MPNs for 2024? 
uh, what's exciting in this field, I think, uh, compared to others maybe, is that uh, the more we study them, the more the complexity <laughs> occurs. <laughs> and it's getting you know, more and more complex. Patients are more and more individual. Uh, uh, rather than you know a very homogeneous group and there's room for many many new studies as well in terms of biology and understanding the disease but also for the therapy of these patients as Claire said we are happy to see that some of these combinations that we hear about for many years are now maturing and the data are coming out so probably next year we will have more of the results of these combos and I think probably there will be a room for almost all of them because each patient is different and each patient need is different and these drugs target different aspects of the disease. So exciting times, I think. Wonderful. No, I agree. I think, I think the more drugs, the better for our patients. We clearly learn that there's a lot of differences. The more options we have, the better off we are. They clearly end up having other secondary uses. You know, in Ruxolitib down the States, they'll use that for everything from vitiligo to other conditions. So, so it's all good, all, all very beneficial. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully this leaves folks with a sense of a lot of movement in the MPN field, a lot of new therapies, uh, important trials being done, uh, excited by the progress. And uh, as always, just any time to uh, spend time with my good friends, Claire and Jean-Jacques, is time well spent. Thank you. <laughs>